scientist who has just said I'm a wind energy consultant and so even though the heading of today's presentation is on mapping of renewables, uh, you will ha be have to do the thinking <laughs> to apply what I will present today to your own technology because I do not claim to be knowledgeable about anything but wind and the examples I'll be using will be largely from wind. Now this presentation is basically about how to make it happen, how to make projects become reality and how macro or what we call mesoscale mapping will help us do that. And it does have a number of elements in common uh, with other technologies, but as I said, the examples I will draw on will be exclusively from uh, the wind sector. <coughs> so uh, the question is, how do we get from the idea of doing a renewable energy project and to the reality? Now, in order to do that, let's see if we can make this work. Uh, in the wind sector, of course, the most basic thing you need is that you need wind. We need a grid. Uh, we need roads. Or we need some ways of, of moving our equipment. And, uh, and finally, we need laws, meaning that we need some sort of regulatory environment. So I will speak today a little bit more broadly than physical resources but also talk about what people sometimes call the enabling framework, meaning the kind of regulations and systems you need to have in place in order to make renewable energy projects happen. Let's see, we have a, oh, there we are. So uh, the point of view I'll be doing here is to look at it primarily from the point of view of developers. I mean, people who are actually going to do the projects, uh, what do they need in order to get their project started. Now, those concerns will be the same for planners and government. That is, that planners who want to do uh, renewable energy policies and stuff like that need to know what developers are thinking because otherwise they won't be doing policies that work. We will talk about the role of mapping and then towards the end I intend to go a little bit into the organization of this, meaning the way governments go about uh, doing uh, renewable energy programs, because the roles of the different parties in the process are different depending on the kind of procurement system you have, meaning uh, do you have a feed-in tariff system, there's somebody here specializing in that I think, or, or do you have a tendering scheme? Uh, are you doing your projects on sites which are pre-selected by your government or the national power company or uh, are you letting developers find them on their own? That makes a lot of difference for who will do the early search for renewable energy resources. And now let's see. Oh. <laughs> Most of the steps I'll be going through here are related to the cost and risk of projects. Of course, in order to make renewable energy competitive, you have to minimize the cost of whatever you're doing uh, and uh, you have to minimize the risk, otherwise nobody dares invest. And commonly in the wind sector and in the other renewable sectors as well, the way most uh, large-scale renewable projects are done today is that they're done as independent power producer projects, meaning that they are uh, built and operated by private, uh, the private sector, which then sells uh, its electricity to the, um, um, to the power grid one way or the other, depending on local market systems. Now, in most of the developing countries I work in, we have very classical utilities, meaning we have often a state-owned uh, power corporation uh, which is responsible for uh, doing it. And, put, and this is actually the case everywhere where I work in, in the Middle East, and, and most of my projects, in fact, have been in the Middle East. Um, the, um, as I said, uh, a number of these cost decisions are really influenced very much by policy. Uh, and a number of them will enter into the program which IRENA is doing now 
namely a program of building a global uh, renewable energy atlas with different sections, uh, one for wind, one for solar, etc. And I am, of course, involved in uh, the wind sector. And I'll be talking a little bit later on the initiative from IRENA, which in some ways is pathbreaking, is highly original, and is not just a repetition of what people have been doing in the past. Now, it's not enough to look at costs and feasibility of projects. You also have to have uh, some sort of framework. I mean, you have to have an ability to sell your power. It's not enough, I mean, it's useless to build a project if you can't sell your power. And all the renewable energy stuff I'll be talking about today is large uh, scale grid connected power projects. Uh, and for that purpose, this is what I was talking about earlier on. At the end, perhaps, I'll go a little bit into that, this, where I say there's a division of labor between private industry and the public sector and the, or the national power company, which is slightly different depending on whether you are in a feed-in tariff system, uh, which very few developing countries are for reasons we'll explain later, or whether you are in a, a system where you tender for uh, power purchasing contracts. Uh, and finally, the first column out here represents demonstration projects. I mean, projects where the government itself or the national power company builds a demonstration plant uh, in order to introduce wind power in the country for the first time. But as I said, we'll get to that at the end. So I have deliberately, every time, the way I'm trying to do it now is that we try to look at it from a bird's eye perspective in the beginning, and then we drill more into it. Now the working process uh, from the developer when he is or she is looking for uh, a wind power site uh, is to look at uh, <coughs> what hopefully is an indication of long-term climate data. A long-term climate is kind of a pleonasm. I mean, it's an expression where we say the same thing twice. Uh, we have to distinguish between weather and climate, as you know. Weather is what you observe outside your window today. Climate is the long-term average kind of, of uh, uh, in our case, uh, wind speeds we experience. Uh, and uh, in the case of wind, it is, I think, a little bit more complicated than with solar in the sense that we're not just interested in uh, wind speeds, we're also interested in the statistical distribution of wind speeds because we're better able to exploit the energy in the wind at high wind speeds and at low wind speeds. There's much more energy in the wind at high wind speeds. Uh, and whatever we do is heavily influenced by the hello, uh, surrounding terrain. Uh, it's heavily influenced by the topography or what we call the orography, meaning uh, the shape of the surface where the wind is blowing. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, so every time we have measured wind somewhere, it's heavily influenced, as I said, by whether we have hills or valleys. It's very much influenced by what we call surface roughness. And surface roughness, for those of you who are not into wind, surface roughness is uh, a representation of how much does the Earth's surface break the wind. So if you are above a very smooth surface, for instance, a lake or a sea, water surface and you have very, very low uh, resistance. Uh, if you have a forest or a city, you will have a considerable slowdown effect of the wind. So the wind will vary considerably with height over terrain. And therefore, we're very interested in knowing also about the surface roughness because it will tell us something about how tall towers we have to use for our turbines, etc. And finally, uh, we will need something which is not always included in some of these mapping, but which is very important indeed, and that's what I call a steep slope map or an inclination map. Because in aerodynamics, when you have winds that uh, blow towards the surface, which is inclined more than 12 to 15 degrees from uh, the angle the wind is coming in, then you will generally start generating turbulence. And turbulent uh, winds you cannot use, notwithstanding what people might try to tell you elsewhere, you cannot extract the energy from turbulent wind because by the first or second law of thermodynamics, if you could extract 
uh, energy from our turbulent winds, then you could actually separate the hot and the cold water in your bathtub, and you can't. <laughs> so so uh, the way energy generally is, is, is generated by a wind turbine, not generally but always, is that you take a laminar flow of, of kinetic energy coming from the wind, and then you convert that into a turbulent stream. And once you've done that, you cannot extract uh, energy again, because as you know, energy can neither be created nor consumed. So this is a little bit of basic physics. Uh, the knowledge of basic physics is actually much more important than most people think. I mean, most people I work with in the World Bank or elsewhere think that it's just a question of doing uh, management of projects. Uh, and you're very wrong because you find that some of the basic errors committed in a lot of projects are related to not understanding the basic physics of this thing, including what I was just telling you now about turbulent winds. If you have a wind farm in one place and you try to place another wind farm downstream of that wind farm, of course the first wind farm will eat the energy from the second wind farm. There's been so many places in the world where I've seen people come with layouts where they actually place wind farms behind one another and it's not a very good idea. <laughs> Generally speaking, it creates a lot of contractual problems also. When we have been, and I'll go into some detail in a moment about this, when we have been through the steps where we have some sort of mapping at this level, then the developer will start doing what I can call constraint filtering. I mean, he will start looking at uh, what are the reasons that we can't build exactly where we would want to because the place we would want to is of course to build here where we have the highest wind speeds. Now the highest wind speeds in this case is out in the middle of the sea and this in, in this case is about 300 meter water depth there so th this is not a place where it's very economical to do wind although there's a lot of wind out there. This by the way is the uh, east coast of Canada. This is called the Gaspé Peninsula and this is the uh, estuary of the St. Lawrence River, just so you know. So it's, it's a real place, and it's a place where I, I have been uh, doing consulting on, on building uh, 1,000 megawatts of wind power and, and, and later 2,000 megawatts. So, so it's an, an area I know well. <coughs> now, um, if you go out with this kind of mapping and do your best, then the sort of uncertainty you will have on your energy estimate is like plus minus 50 percent and that's a lot. We'll get to that in a moment but I mean it influences the economics of the project enormously of course. Uh, so in order to refine our study a little bit more than doing a preliminary cost calculation we will start looking at grid maps. Uh, so the most natural thing to do if you're doing a mapping anyway is that you overlay your maps uh, uh, of, of your wind resource uh, with a grid layer where you have the transmission grid. Now that's a primitive way of doing it because that way you can say okay say within 25 kilometers on, of my grid if I have a large project I may be able to afford building a power line but still the farther you are from the transmission grid the more expensive it will be. Now that, it's not as simple as that actually because it's not enough to have a grid. You also must be able to absorb the energy on that grid, which means that you basically need, uh, and, and unfortunately there are very few places where they do this, but in this particular lo uh, location in Quebec in Canada where I've been working, they did it. You, you should actually uh, do a cost study of your grid, meaning that you should determine for each radial, each section of your grid, what would be the additional cost of putting in, say, 100 megawatts of wind power, 200, 300 megawatts. And in fact, when uh, Hydro-Quebec in Canada did sort of a, this is almost, the reason why I take this example is it's almost textbook-like, they actually did this uh, study beforehand. So we had a map of Quebec where we could tell what are the grid connection costs in different parts? What would it cost us to reinforce the grid, meaning building stronger power lines, I mean power lines with higher voltage, higher uh, transmission capacity? Uh, what would it cost us in, in uh, each of these areas? So having that idea was very important because, again, this was almost a textbook-like way of doing it because what we're trying to do is not just to minimize the kilowatt hour cost of wind energy, 
we actually try to minimize the overall cost, including whatever it would cost us to make grid reinforcement. Now, one of the problems you have with wind energy, some of the other renewables as well, but wind in particular, is that the wind tends to blow a lot where people do not want to live very often because they don't want to live where it's windy. <laughs> So therefore, you will often find that the very best wind resources are located in places with practically no population. So this is a safe bet. I remember once I came to the extreme north of Norway, just on the Russian frontier, and, and uh, I, I could tell that just by looking at where the villages were, that that's not where we wanted to place the wind turbines. We would actually want to place them on the side of the islands or the peninsulas where there were no people because we could guess that that's probably where it's windy, hence that there are no towns or villages. <laughs> so, uh, so that's a very common situation. And therefore, you run into the policy problem that if you want wind to happen <coughs> in areas where you have a tremendously good resource, you sometimes have to build very long transmission lines. Uh, and this is where this cartography of wind can help you. I'll get to an example of how in Egypt, we actually had to, to build a 280 kilometer, uh, 500 kilovolt double circuit <laughs> transmission line, which is an enormously expensive project, several hundred million of dollars. Uh, and uh, that is precisely because the very best wind resources in Egypt are located in places where there are practically no people and therefore no transmission grid. Yes? Is this uh, does it decrease efficiency dramatically or? You mean you mean the, uh, the losses yeah, for the transport? Is so high or not? I mean, okay, the cost is high. Yeah. For infrastructure. Yeah. No, the energy losses are fairly small on on high voltage transmission grids. I mean, if you're something at the 500 kilovolt level, you may be losing only two three percent at the most. So so the overall loss you have in, in a typical, I mean, in a well-run run transmission grid where people are not stealing electricity and all that, uh, is maybe 7 or 8% for transmission plus distribution. And at the transmission level, losses are typically very small, 3 to 4%, again, depending a little bit on the length of your lines and stuff like that. But the losses you suffer are minor uh, uh, actually, so, but of course, you have to enter that into your calculations as well, for sure. Uh, in addition to that, uh, wind equipment is heavy. I mean, it's, 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 you have to haul it around, and therefore, uh, you need to have road and city maps, of course, and you need city maps because you can't locate them in cities, uh, not just because it might, you might get trouble with the population, but also because of the high structures you have in cities, you will have a lot of turbulence. So here in Mazdar City, it's not, generally speaking, a good idea to put up a wind turbine unless you want to have a nice demonstration project that looks like something because you'll have a lot of turbulence due to the buildings. Uh, finally, there can be other constraints. And again, this depends on uh, uh, how well developed those constraints are. Uh, it depends on on the place we're in. Uh, again, I'm using, uh, trying to use the same example uh, where, from Quebec, where I work myself. Initially, when we did the same project, Quebec was a developing country because there was no wind power when we started. There was one 26 kilowatt turbine standing in, in the extreme uh, Arctic areas, <laughs> and that's it. So therefore, there were very, very few policies on zoning, on areas which are suitable for wind power, on areas that are off limits to wind power, and stuff like that. So this is something which very often is an essential early step in developing renewable energy, is that you have policies in place where you try to avoid the problems before they occur. And by avoiding problems, uh, I would say, in, in the case of, of, uh, of Quebec, uh, you had uh, hostilities from some farmers who didn't think that it was a good idea to start using their land for wind farms. Generally speaking, farmers are friendly, though, because most of them make far more money from compensation of having a wind turbine tower on their land than they do from agriculture. So the problems you really run into are the neighbors of farmers who, get who do not get compensation, they complain. <laughs> so if you don't 
so, so one of the key issues in, in a place like, I mean, go to Quebec or go to Mexico for that matter, one of the key issues we had to work with is how do we treat people who do not get compensation? So therefore, actually, we managed to work out a recommended uh, uh, compensation scheme where we compensated even people who did not get wind turbines. So we said within the entire perimeter of a wind farm, regardless of whether you have a wind turbine on your land or not, you'll get a little bit of compensation in the people who are really bothered by the fact that they have to turn their tractor when they drive around the wind turbine. <laughs> they will get more compensation. But if you don't compensate everybody, you get into strange situations like we have in Mexico where a wind farm the World Bank was involved with, uh, you have holes in, in between the wind turbines because certain farmers did not want them. And then afterwards, of course, these very same farmers were very furious that they didn't get a wind turbine. They said, well, you didn't get a wind turbine because you, you complained. And then they said, but then I don't get compensation. And the answer is, yes, you're absolutely right, you didn't. <laughs> so therefore, some of these problems you could avoid by having a well thought out way of dealing with it beforehand. And that's part of what this is all about. Oops, here we are. Now, <coughs> let me take an example of the stuff I showed you in the first map. Now, this map here <coughs> of this particular corner of Canada actually gives you uh, the mean wind speed of the area. I'll get to in a moment how these maps are developed. I mean, the technology you use and, and, and the kind of science you use to get there. But what you can get out of this kind of mapping, which is called mesoscale mapping, is a type of map like this where you do, uh, on the basis of satellite data, as I said, I'll go to get to it in a moment. On, uh, I just have to check if I, oh, wait. Uh, <coughs> so anyway, you have a number of things you can get out of this kind of mapping, which is a preliminary mapping of an area. And in fact, this kind of map, which you can go out and find on the internet, which is called the Canadian Wind Energy Atlas. Here we have a ma complete map of all of Canada, where for each and every square like this, you can go in there, you can zoom in, and you can find out something about the mean wind speeds or the expected mean wind speed. We'll get to the precision and all that in a moment. You can also uh, find, let's see, when the computer wants to do something, it's working on it. <laughs> anyway, as I was saying, I mean, you can get the mean wind speed, you can get the mean wind energy. For those of you who are familiar with physics, uh, the energy in the wind uh, varies with the third power of the wind speed. Uh, actually, it's an application of Newton's second law, but, but, so, but it isn't a square. In the case of wind, it's, a, it's a third power. And you can work that out on paper. Why? Uh, oh, let's see why it doesn't. Oh, here it is. So one of the other things we can get out of uh, the wind map is that we have satellite data on uh, what we call roughness. And roughness of the terrain, here we have a desert area. Now in a desert you have a very low surface roughness. Uh, it's almost like a sea surface. So you don't have uh, the surface uh, here in Egypt, you don't have it breaking the wind very much. So the wind speed at this height and this height are almost alike. Uh, so therefore, uh, the sort of, of uh, relationship you have with different heights is maybe this curve. If you go to a place like Tehuantepec in Mexico, which is narrow part, narrowest part of Mexico where the wind blows like crazy from the Atlantic towards the Pacific half the year and the opposite direction the other half of the year, there you see you in typical farmland. So we have, we have uh, uh, things growing here, we have trees, and all that will break the wind somewhat. And therefore, here you would, te technically speaking, it would be optimal to have higher towers than you would in, in a place like Egypt. Because there you don't get much additional wind ge power generation by adding it to the tower height. Here you get a lot. So depending on the price of your electricity per kilowatt hour, uh, you, you will choose different tower heights. Uh, now the way these maps are done uh, is that you basically use uh, satellite data. And the, there's something called synthetic aperture radar. It's a technique by which you can measure when the satellite flies overhead, you can measure the elevation of each point. 
And actually, you can go onto the internet uh, in, in, on a website uh, run by NASA or the US government, and you can actually find a 90 by 90 meter grid of the entire globe where uh, you can find the elevation of each point. So this is the kind of stuff which modelers then use to build a 3D model of the Earth's surface. Plus, as I say, all upstream neighboring areas. Because when we model wind for a whole country, we, wind doesn't stop or start <laughs> at, at uh, political borders. Of course, it, the wind comes from somewhere. So depending on the wind climate, this is why it's a little bit fishy when I say upstream. It means that if the wind comes from one side all the time, which is the case, for instance, in Egypt where I work, then it's simple. Then you only need to go towards the south or the uh, south uh, east, <laughs> rather, uh, because the wind blows from there all the time. You need not really be very much concerned about anything else. But if you go to more typical climates where the wind may be blowing for, from different directions, you actually need to have a 3D model of all the neighboring countries. This is one of the reasons why there are big economies of scale in doing this kind of modeling for several countries at the same time. And, and this is one of the reasons why IRENA is also in the business of, of uh, wanting to do this for larger areas, although using a different technology, as I'll get to in a moment. Uh, then there's another kind of satellites um, which will give you land cover. Now that's used by agriculture, and those of you who are interested in biomass and stuff like that probably know this already. But actually, these satellites, again, using some sort of radar uh, system, uh, they can tell the difference between whether you have a city underneath, whether you have forests, grassland, desert, lakes, sea surfaces. And all of these surfaces slow down the wind differently. So you, not just have, you don't just build inside your computer a 3D model of uh, your country and the neighboring areas. You actually also know how rough each part of the uh, surface is. And you need that for your simulation. Then we come to the third step, and, and that is uh, that we go out, and again, this is something which people can download basically for free, uh, again from a, a website run by the US government, but which really has collected for very many years uh, global weather data. Global weather data comes from uh, ground-based measurement stations, comes from upper atmospheric measurements, usually done by weather balloons, uh, and other techniques uh, can be done from aircraft and stuff. But anyway, what you do have in a global weather model is that in principle, you know all the time what you think the way, the way the wind, the direction and the wind speed you have in the upper uh, areas of the atmosphere, meaning at a height of about 10 kilometers or so. So what we do <coughs> is that we take preferably 30 years, but if we can't get it, then we'll take less, take uh, 20, uh, 10 years, and then we'll do a sampling for all the hours of the year. So we'll take 8,000, no, what we, would it be, uh, uh, 8,670 observations, which we draw at random from some of these historical things. And then for each of those, what I'm trying to tell you here is that it's nice to have these maps. It gives you an idea of where to look. But my experience in general is that you usually end up never using what purportedly is the uh, area with the most energy in the wind. But you often go out here. And the reason is that you have local effects which you can't see on these maps. Because this map was done with a resolution of maybe three or four kilometers. So that means that basically we are averaging out the hills and valleys. Even though the model can feel there's a mountain here, it's highly imprecise. The reason why we can't model with a resolution which is much above, say, one kilometer squares is that the uh, computation of these things grow roughly with the third uh, power of the resolution you're working with. <laughs> so therefore, uh, if it, takes you, it took you two weeks to compute this, you want, if you wanted to double the resolution, it would take you like 24 weeks or something like that. So it's not, it's not as simple as that to increase the resolution uh, of this without 
uh, having major costs. So, just to repeat what I was just saying, we have a uh, simplified topography, which means that we can't really see local effects. Uh, the, the cost penalty I talked about, steep hills and mountain ridges give uh, false signals. And then I say we uh, ignore uh, local speed up effects. And what I've been trying to draw in this picture, which is from a website with 256 pages on wind energy, for those of you who are interested, <laughs> uh, uh, when you have the wind that blows towards a nice rounded hills like, hill like this, actually it shouldn't be quite as steep, but I mean I have to make a drawing. So, <laughs> But if you have a hill here <coughs> which has <laughs> less than 12% uh, uh, angle here, uh, then you will find that the wind that comes in from there has to go somewhere. So it gets compressed and it flows across the ridge here. So on ridges like this, you will have very high wind speeds. I mean, even Leonardo da Vinci, by the way, in one of his works back in the 1400s, uh, wrote about this. <laughs> so, so it's a well-known phenomenon. One thing which is a little bit tricky when you go to hills like this and where mesoscale models can't really tell, or even microscale models have great trouble telling you what's happening, is that the wind that's compressed and flows up the mountain here has a very, very high speed. So what you normally see is that instead of having a profile where the wind speed increases with height, in some of these places you might find that the wind speed increases with height and then it decreases. <laughs> and then it increases again. And the reason is that some of the, the wind that comes from here uh, has a much higher speed than the other wind. We may not have turbulence. If, if, if this is a round hill, we're okay. We may not have turbulence. But you get what we call inverse wind shear. And that means that it's very, very difficult uh, to estimate exactly where the highest wind speed is. So this is why you actually have to plant an anemometer mast there or use something called SODAR or LIDAR where you use remote sensing, uh, meaning you bounce, um, you use the, the Doppler effect. You, t you, you take a laser beam and, and you shoot the laser beam at the dust particles that blow across the hill. And, and then from the, the Doppler effect, I mean the reflection of that, you can tell the wind speed here. You can't bank on that wind speed, meaning you can't do it accurately enough that a bank would trust you, but it will help you determine where to look for the highest wind speed. So this is a very tricky situation, but actually a situation we love to work in because we get super high wind speeds, but it's very difficult because we have to measure in order to find out where it is because our science is not good enough. <laughs> uh, one general problem we have with a lot of stuff you find out in the market, and one of the reasons why in the presentation I'm going to give a, later on to uh, Irina today, uh, I'm going to go a lot into this issue, and that is that a lot of companies out there who do this kind of mesoscale modeling do something, use something they call proprietary algorithms, and it just translated into English, it means that they don't won't tell you what they're doing, but they claim that they're doing something that makes sense. I wouldn't trust them an inch, uh, but some of these keep, uh, companies are actually doing fairly well. I mean, they're selling their, their wares anyway, but it's not the kind of thing which, if I were Irina, I would endorse because the, the problem is that you don't really have a clue of what they're doing, and some of them might be selling you something which is simple mathematics applied to a, uh, the, the <coughs> altitude <laughs> of the terrain or something like that. You can't really tell. So that is a major problem in this industry. Uh, and secondly, it's not as easy as it seems because when I was saying that you draw samples of, uh, that you build your 3D model using uh, uh, this data you can download from the internet and that uh, you sample uh, 10 or 30 years of observations, the results you get out of it are very, very sensitive to sampling techniques. So you have to be extremely knowledgeable about statistics in order to know what you're doing because it will influence your results. And this is why, although this looks nice, it looks very impressive, people who are old hands and experienced in the industry uh, don't really trust it when it, you, it comes down to building a project. But they will use it in order to find out where to measure wind. Now there is a different way of doing some of these representations and here I've taken the um, uh, wind atlas for Egypt, which was done by Rizu National Laboratory. 
uh, together with the uh, Noon Renewable Energy uh, uh, Authority in Egypt. Now the interesting thing about this map is that Egypt all of a sudden looks very different from Lebanon. It looks much smoother. <laughs> now that is an optical illusion because what the people from Rizu have done here is that they have taken, I mean done exactly what you just saw on the Lebanese map and you get a lot of different uh, small dots here and there and then they subtract the local influence meaning that if you have a speed up effect from a hill they subtract it from the result if you have a slow down effect uh, from change of roughness or, or the, if you're on the hind side of a hill then uh, they, uh, <coughs> they add to it. So what's interesting about this map is really that this map really tells you what Egypt would look like if the earth were round. <laughs> and by that I mean if it were a round globe completely smooth or with a given roughness to say. I mean in this case we have something called a given roughness length. Uh, so, so, we know, so here we, have, we pretend that Egypt is a smooth surface which is completely round and then we get this map. What's interesting about this map and the way you can use it in planning is that you can see that out here something is happening and what you see here really tells you, doesn't tell you exactly spot by spot what's happening but it tells you that all this area has super normal wind speeds it has something which we would not have expected due to local influences. So there's some forces at work here which cannot be explained by hills and, and, and roughness. And this means that the way you would use a map like that is that you would go down in that area and start measuring the wind, which of course is what the Egyptians did. <laughs> they started doing that more than 20 years ago. So they had a whole system of measurement stations across Egypt, more than 35 masts, I think, where they've been measuring for 10 to 15 years. So this is, the reason why I'm showing this example is that it's perhaps the most perfect way of doing wind development I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, so the projects I work on right now in Egypt where we're working actually on 2,500 megawatts of wind and where we're building the first uh, 250 megawatt wind farm will probably be tendered this year and where in fact we're building a 280 kilometer transmission line out to this area where there are no people uh, is that we rely on populating this area with wind turbines because it's so super high wind speeds down, down here and then the Egyptians very scientifically have used uh, in addition to this area uh, they'll be using this area and this area east and west of the more upper part of the Nile uh, for their subsequent wind development. So here you can see how these mapping exercises are actually used in the real world for planning purposes. So just this year, uh, actually in the end of the autumn, last autumn and, and this year, they're planting 11 anemometer masts, 80 meter anemometer masts out here in order to start measuring the wind in the area, uh, in order to validate the results we have here. Uh, just to give you an idea of the differences here, I mean the typical wind speeds we have down in this area are about 10 to 11 meters per second uh, measured at 80 meter height. So this is one of the windiest areas of the world, in, in fact. Uh, I mean you have to go to Patagonia in, in, in Argentina, Comodoro Rivadavia, you have to go to Tehuantepec in Mexico or to the southern part of the North Island of New Zealand to find similar wind speeds. So, so this is quite unique. Uh, so, and, and here the wind uh, is blowing all the time along the coast like, like this in one direction only. Uh, you find the same thing over here in, in uh, Yemen and incidentally you also have the wind coming like this all the time. Uh, so anyway, a practical application of something uh, scientific. This Egyptian wind atlas in my, if I were to give grades to something, I'd say that this is perhaps the most modern and most advanced uh, uh, wind atlas and probably one of the more reliable ones that we find in the world, although the Canadian one is very nice because it's in the public domain, you can work it on the internet and you can do a lot of stuff. So I will try to go through the next part because now I actually went into some detail with you on mesoscale mapping, how it's done, how you can use these maps and basically what we always use them for is to determine where 
uh, you would want to do further investigations, uh, meaning that you would start to measure putting up anemometer masks. Now, IRENA has ganged up with Rezo National Laboratory and invented a completely different way of, not completely, but slightly different way of doing it because IRENA, and I, I think this is a very interesting initiative, uh, IRENA has a, an ambition of uh, doing a global wind atlas. Now the idea of doing a global wind atlas uh, is uh, scientifically interesting, of course, because one of the problems we have is that the wind atlases, as I showed them to you, have been done using different methodologies that displayed different ways. And sometimes the methods by which they are used are highly <coughs> non-transparent. So therefore, it's very hard to compare between countries. Uh, so when you start afresh a new, uh, in a new place, you don't really have a clue uh, how well you can use these maps. So IRENA wanted to uh, go out and do a global wind atlas. And the reason why we can th even think of doing it this th these days is that computing power, I mean, the cost of computing power has gone dramatically down, as you know. Uh, and uh, some of the technologies to do this are there. This was a politically very difficult thing, I think. I mean, now I can speak freely because I'm not part of IRENA, so I can only guess. But I mean, politically, it's a little bit difficult to do this because you have a lot of commercial firms out there who are doing mesoscale modeling. <laughs> and if IRENA goes out and does its own global wind atlas, what will all these companies say? Because you're, so to speak, taking the bread out of their mouth. Uh, so I think that that could be part of the reasoning from IRENA that in order not to get into trouble, they're using a different technology, a different way of seeing things and different scientific method. The actual thing is that they are going to use the same weather model data I was talking about to, uh, to you earlier on. Uh, they're going to do the sampling from the, um, uh, the um, weather model data, but then they're going to skip the entire mesoscale modeling and instead, they're going into high resolution topography, meaning that they will actually model in with the 90 meter grid I was talking about really early on. So rather than using a kilometer wide grid or something like that, they will be doing a high resolution. Now, I just told you earlier on that if you were doing mesoscale modeling, that would be virtually impossible because computing time would converge, or it would not even converge, it would go to, towards infinity almost, <laughs> uh, if you had that kind of resolution. So what they will be doing is that they will be doing microscale modeling. And some of you who have been working with WASP or, or something similar, uh, they will know that that's a tool where you actually model the influences of hills, of changing roughness, of this and that, and where you do it at so to speak, the wind farm level, actually. I mean, the, when we're in WASP, we're, we're talking about hundreds of meters. Uh, we're not talking about kilometers of stuff. Such modeling has actually been done in a number of countries in, in uh, Europe. Uh, in Denmark, for instance, there's a, a, um, a map with a resolution of about 100 meters uh, of the entire country. And that's being used by the municipalities for wind turbine planning. So, a, and a similar model has been developed uh, for s different Spanish provinces, and I think they're about to do a, a whole model of Spain at this very high resolution. Uh, this is a new way of doing it, that you try to avoid going through the mesoscale uh, idea, and that you try to model directly with the tools that we normally use for working with anemometer mass and actually doing sighting of individual wind turbines in the landscape or within a wind farm. But again, it's computationally possible to do it today. The interesting thing that would come out of a model like that is that where I said that, oh, when I look at a map of Lebanon, you know, I don't care about these ridges because I don't really believe in them uh, because I think most of them are rugged. So once I've looked at the steepness of the hills, I'll probably reject them. Uh, and uh, I said that we might be looking up there, but unfortunately I can't see the individual hill because it has been averaged out. That will not happen here. Here we can actually see the individual hills. So here we'll get a picture at a very, very high resolution where 
once we've looked at that, we will have more of an idea of where we want to go. And because the next step you'll do in this process is that you go out and you take a look. Because this, sometimes things look different from what they do on the map. So the most important thing you can do in, that, in, in this industry is to, to be out there and on, the, on the site actually. I always insist on doing that, but I, I'm shocked time and again in, in, in the projects I work on when I find that some of the engineering uh, companies who've been working on it have never been on the site. Sometimes it leads, by the way, to slightly disastrous projects in the sense that you start planting wind turbines in people's backyards without them you know, really agreeing about it, so <coughs> it's not such a good idea. Now, what you need to do if you, if you adopt this brand new methodology is that you need verification. And then there are uh, two ways they intend to do that verification of the model. Uh, one is to uh, compare it with the results you get out of, of uh, uh, mesoscale modeling, but actually also to compare it with ground-based observations. So again, we will have the kind of verification which I talked about earlier on when you compare with real-world anemometers, but we will also have a verification where we actually try on some selected areas, not the entire world, uh, but on some selected areas, uh, particularly the more complex ones, to go out and see how well does it compare with that and how does it compare to what we find out by, by doing measurements on the ground. And then finally, uh, we have a third method uh, for remote sensing, I mean for finding out what wind speeds are when we are over water and particularly when we are over the oceans uh, because their wave heights really tell you something about the wind speeds. And again, using uh, this technology called synthetic aperture radar, you can actually tell more or less what the waves look like or the angles on the waves. So you can actually sense um, the wind speed at sea probably more accurately possibly than you can almost measure it by looking at uh, the wave patterns on the sea and this is this you can do from satellite so uh, so in the in the if you take the offshore areas near the coasts of course because most of what's interesting in terms of wind energy is onshore um, for reasons of cost <laughs> Uh, then uh, you have uh, another way here of, of uh, verifying your uh, measurements. So this, as I said, is a brand new technology. It's very interesting and, and uh, one problem IRENA has, as I understand it, is that it doesn't have much funding on its own, but apparently the Danish, the German and the Spanish government are going to foot the bill and have their uh, scientific institutes, which in those three countries are some of the best, do the, uh, the work. Now, <laughs> we got through all this very remote sensing, uh, and then I'll just take you through the kind of steps we, we'd normally use in the industry uh, when you have done this remote sensing, because after the, we have done that, uh, we want to go out and build a real wind farm. But, so therefore, there's a lot of paperwork going on uh, in, in developer where you still sit and do some disk research before you go out uh, and uh, plant your anemometer mass because it costs a good deal of money to actually measure uh, on the ground. Uh, and what you need is that it's best if you have high resolution digital mapping. And there's something very interesting has recently happened, which I have to tell you about because it's the first time I tried it. Uh, in Egypt, where we're building, uh, as I said, a 250 megawatt wind farm right now, or private developers will be uh, building it. There we have uh, invented for the first time in the world a joint wind measurement campaign because it's a predetermined site uh, 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 which is being auctioned off by the Egyptian government. And then we have, um, the developers jointly uh, measure. And the reason why they're measuring jointly is that it would be silly to have 10 developers each put five masts on the site. I mean, putting 50 anemometer masts on the same site is crazy, is wasteful. And second of all, uh, uh, we wanted to have the developers themselves being responsible for the measurement. So the only thing 
we did or the Egyptian government did was that we had fairly strict minimum requirements for measuring. So it's sort of a textbook measurement campaign we ordered, which was so expensive that no developer wanted to measure on his own. <laughs> so we more or less forced them into measuring it jointly. In that context, we had some experience that when you have humans out there doing uh, maps, uh, then you have surveyors out there, and then previous experience from Egypt told us that some of the surveyors, when they saw a big rock, which was like you know, 20 meters tall, <laughs> they just forgot it in the picture. And when you came out there, you found out that it's not such a good way, a way of, of building a road there or putting a turbine there because it's 20 meters up in the air. So in order to avoid that, we have actually done uh, what we call aerial laser scanning. Nowadays, you can actually fairly cheaply uh, hire an aircraft with uh, laser uh, and, and, and you will laser scan the entire area. So there we will have a, so now we actually have a map of our site with a 50 centimeter vertical precision and a one, uh, one meter horizontal precision uh, for all of the area. Uh, so, and, and the aircraft was out there one afternoon, it flew across the area, they looked at their data and then they found out that there was some noise in the data in some areas and then they flew a second time on the affected areas and after, I mean, two days of work, <laughs> well, plus some post-processing, they actually came back with this super high resolution map. That's, that's a brand new technology, we've never seen anything as accurate as that before. And, and the interesting thing about it is that the map on, on which they're basing their uh, bids will be the same map they can use when afterwards they're going there to do their construction work. They don't even need to go out on the site. They can sit in their computers because they have a complete 3D model of the site with a 50 centimeter precision. Um, you might not, in the early phases, you will not want that kind of precision. I mean, first of all, WASP, uh, the, the micro scale modeling tool you have, uh, is not accurate. I mean, doesn't. Uh, can't really feel whether you have a one or two meter precision in, in what you're measuring. So you probably would not do it if you're an individual developer just looking for a single site, but if you're doing this kind of work, you will do it. This, by the way, is the site in Egypt I was talking about. This is the dark area here. Uh, normally, a nightmare is that you have to deal with land ownership, which can be very complicated. In Egypt, it's easy because it's a government-owned la land and there's nobody out there. So, I mean, it's really two things. I mean, many places around the world, you have government-owned land, but when you go out there and look in reality, you find out that there are people squatting there. So even though they don't have a right to live there, uh, generally speaking, at least if you're doing problem, uh, programs for, for the World Bank or, or some of the regional development banks or, or the IFC, uh, we, in quotation marks, respect people even if they don't have a right to live there. So in Yemen, for instance, uh, where the Yemenis themselves said that there are no people on this site, when you go out there in reality, you can see that they're actually p poor uh, refugees from across the strait who, who are living there in, in huts, and actually a number of displaced Yemenis who are living there in, in quite literally huts made out of, of sticks and, and, and leaves. So uh, they have to be served too in, in that particular example. I mean, they're actually getting free electricity before and, and, and then they're trying to move them into a central location because it's kind of difficult to pipe out the electricity all, all across the site. But anyway, the land ownership can be a nightmare to deal with uh, uh, because in many countries, uh, land ownership is kind of uncertain. Yemen is an example where Kalashnikovs are more important than a land registry uh, for uh, asserting uh, property rights, I think. So therefore, uh, it, it depends a lot on the jurisdiction you're working in. Uh, but in many cases, you also have many landowners uh, which are difficult to trace. Uh, this is an example from Lesotho, where I've been working. Beautiful country, uh, all mountain tops, and they wanted to do a site, and this is exactly near the site, and we had the luck of having a helicopter so we could survey the surrounding area. <laughs> And here you have a road bend. It's hard to tell for you, but I mean, this, if th I say that this distance is maybe 40 meters, then you can see that it's a very, very hard kink. Now, it's not so problematic because you could drive with a truck and the road uh, and the tower could pass this way, but when you come to this bend, you have a problem. <laughs> you need a new road. <laughs> uh, and that actually m made us reject the site because it would be too complicated to build a fairly small project and build a new road because this is very, very mountainous terrain. So 
details like that you can't see on on large maps or you have to be very smart to see them anyway so it's always a good idea to go out there uh, if you have obstacles near it, and here in this case it's, I, I have illustrated a building, but then you get these kind of funny wind flows around the obstacles and, and they will create both turbulence uh, and uh, displace your wind pattern. So if your turbines will be located too close to trees or buildings or stuff, uh, then you have to be careful about that. So that's another thing we're looking at. Uh, then when we are going to do a wind measurement campaign, one of the most important things we have is not that we measure for one, two, or three years. The most important thing is that we preferably have very long time series where we have, because the big problem when you measure wind is that you never know whether you measured in a good or a bad wind year. And good or bad wind years can vary with 20%. On average, wind energy is quite stable from year to year. Actually, it's more stable than agricultural production is, for instance. So it's more stable than rainfall and lots of things. But uh, still, you c if we measure in a very bad year, we can underestimate or overestimate the wind resource by, by 20% or so. And we'll get to the economic calculations on that in a moment. But it can be an ab absolute disaster for the project. So therefore, if you go out and you measure for one year only, then you have a huge uncertainty on your estimate. And therefore, your banker is likely to require that you have an enormously high tariff, because otherwise he doesn't trust that you won't go broke when you build the project. So therefore, reducing that risk, of course, you can measure another year, and that will reduce your risk somewhat. But I mean, the, statistically, your uncertainty goes down quite slowly. The best thing you can have is that if you have nearby reasonable quality measurements. They need not be accurate in the sense that what we, only we only really care about the variation from year to year. We don't really care if your anemometer is, is calibrated wrongly so it measures the wrong wind speed, but we care a lot whether the wind speed is 10 or 20 percent higher or lower than normal. And this is one of the places where we're really in a bad shape in most developing countries. So what some people do and in, and in some cases they get away with it, they go back to the weather models I talked about earlier and they use the time series they can download on the internet and then they say, I use those. But before doing that, they just check, does it actually correlate well with what we can measure on the ground? And unfortunately in some places we find, I mean, I'd say in about half the places we find it's very poorly correlated. <laughs> So therefore, we can't even trust those measurements. And that means that on some sites, there's no two ways about it. We have to measure for a long, long time because in most developing countries, meteorology measurements are very poor. Uh, you don't have reasonably long uh, time series of, of a reasonable quality. And as I said, even if we don't care about the accurate preci absolute precision, because that's not important for weather forecasting either, uh, in, and that's why they can use them as weather stations. You often find that they have only been measuring wind like you know three times a day. They have a guy who comes down to the anemometer and notes what the wind speed is at that moment. Actually, it's not a completely silly way of doing it. Uh, it's much better than averaging over a long period that you actually look at the current uh, wind speed, statistically speaking. But still, it's generally speaking too poor uh, to be usable. So this is a super important step. The next thing that's going to ruin a lot of projects is that you need what's called an environmental and social impact assessment. And when I say it's going to ruin a lot of projects, it's not because it's so difficult to, f to put wind turbines up there. Uh, and they may not cause much environmental problems. But your banker and everybody else is not going to trust you unless you have investigated those things thoroughly in advance. And in this example, what I show here are you know, the prevalence of different birds, migrating birds on a, a specific wind farms. But I mean, you, you often need, if you are located in a migratory bird route, you need to do a, a bird study uh, in order to see how uh, to deal with it. Unfortunately, the science in this area is relatively poor. I mean, it's not that, that ornithologists are poor scientists, it's just that the natural background variation in what birds actually do is enormous. 
So there are patterns in certain areas. I mean, you have well-defined migratory routes, and we're facing actually replacing our wind farms in Egypt, right? And one of those, <laughs> where you have 40 or 60,000 storks uh, in, in the springtime, white storks coming through. And, and since, according to European legend, it's the storks who bring the babies, it's a major issue, of course. Sorry about the joke, but anyway, the uh, it, no, it is a it is a major issue, uh, uh, of course, bec uh, for some species. I mean, if it, it depends on the rarity of the species, so there you go into a completely different value system. I mean, one where you have to understand the politics of the thing, and therefore, I always say that. I don't really think that they are bird problems, they're only people problems, because it's people's perception of what is problematic that counts, not absolute scientific numbers. And if a species is considered rare or valuable, then it, even one uh, copy of that species is, is very important. <laughs> so, so, uh, so those are issues you have to deal with and where you have to have an enormous amount of sensitivity, just like you have to have an enormous amount of sensitivity to your neighbors if you have any. Uh, then we have a lot of regulatory stuff. Could be microwave corridors. You don't place wind turbines in the middle of microwave corridors because it can disturb the radio signals, but if you are a few hundred meters away, you're fine. Uh, but you may have requirements of aviation markings. You may have uh, the defense or the Air Force or something like that, which creates problems for you. Generally speaking, aviation problems really only exist if you are on the, you know, close to the runways, directly in the flight line uh, to, a, uh, to an airport. Uh, you can have tall turbines near airports without major problems. And you can actually also have, uh, notwithstanding what some of your military might say, you can have turbines without disturbing military radar, because military radar can actually distinguish between cars and trucks and ships and all kinds of things. So it's a question of putting the right signature in there. But the problem when dealing with the military in every country is that uh, they won't ever give you a reasoning because their reasoning is secret, <laughs> military secret. Finally, you have to deal with uh, local government. So I took a mayor out here. <laughs> to, how do you symbolize that uh, any other way? But you can be dealing with uh, lots of issues. I mean, local government is one thing. Uh, in places like Mexico, uh, you have something called the Hidio system, which means that you don't really have individual land ownership. Actually, this happens in a lot of, uh, uh, in, in uh, for instance, areas of, of uh, I mean, Inuit populations and Indian popu uh, I mean, American Indian populations. You have, um, a similar situation that you don't have individual land ownership, but you have collective land ownership. And sometimes the administration of the land ownership is separate from the city government, which is elected, and, and the other one, you're a shareholder by virtue of, of de facto having a right to use your land. So it can be quite complicated in areas like that because you have to agree both with the political authorities at local level, at national level, and the local landowners collectively and individually. So you can have so many layers of responsibility. In some cases, people give up and go for government land instead. <laughs> or in some countries, um, uh, government traditionally, I mean, for instance, in Jordan, traditionally, the government has expropriated all land used for, for uh, power generation purposes because they think that dealing with the land ownership issue is too difficult to deal with otherwise. So all of these elements, plus whatever you can think of, <laughs> enter into the picture when uh, we pick a site for uh, uh, wind development. Finally, then we put up anemometer masts. Now these days, turbines are quite tall. Uh, generally speaking, I mean, if you look at something like two or three megawatt turbine, they typically have hub heights at around 80 meters or above. The safest way of doing projects, and particularly if you're dealing with a large project, is that you measure at hub height. So in this case, this is our Egyptian project. Here we have an 80 meter mast, uh, and, and uh, that's the likely hub height because we have, the military has declared that we have a 120 meter maximum height, and the bird people have declared that we have a 120 meter maximum height. So on this one, you could actually put a, um, not on this tower, of course, but on a real wind turbine tower, <laughs> you could put an 80-meter rotor on an 80-meter tower, and you'd be all right. Actually, this area has a very low roughness, so you might even want shorter towers than, than 80 meters.
But uh, <coughs> in any case, uh, we measure at uh, four different heights here. Uh, so, so this is the kind of, of uh, setup we'd be using. And in this case, we have a site where you can see that we have some ruggedness within the site. I mean, most of the area is fairly flat, but we have some towards the, the west, we have some uh, kind of ruggedness. And, and this kind of ruggedness gives turbulence and it gives some uncertainty in our wind measurements. So therefore, we, uh, <coughs> when uh, we were writing the um, uh, measurement specifications for this site, we required five masts, which is a lot, but which actually gives us a great degree of certainty. The major problem I find with wind measurement campaigns and everything I've seen in developing countries and to a certain extent in developed countries is that people try to save a few thousand dollars on equipment, which is completely ridiculous because wind farms, I mean, we're talking here about a wind farm which will cost like $500 million. So therefore, <coughs> a scientific, the difference in price between a scientific anemometer and a cheap one is about, in one case, $300 and the other one, $1,000 go for $1,000 because the precision you, uh, you, you will have there will be very, very important when you go to your banker. Yes? Uh, like in this case in Egypt, uh, what is the effect of uh, dust storms and sandstorms on uh, the wind turbine? Actually, f uh, much less than we thought. Uh, we, we dust is a problem, uh, and you can see that when you go 150 kilometers farther north where, uh, I mean, Egypt already has 550 megawatts of wind power installed near Zafarana on the Gulf of Suez. That's 150 kilometers farther north. Now, there's not as much wind as here, but one of the interesting things we find is that we thought that it, 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 just as you were saying, that sand would grind down the smooth surface of the rotor blades, which would be bad. Uh, what we find is that the air is so heavily polluted from oil already that the old, old rotor blades actually have an oil film on them. <laughs> uh, because this area, there's oil extraction in the area also. And if you look at Google Earth, it looks terrible. I mean, we're talking about environmental protection, but there are lakes of oil out there, I can tell you. I mean, which are not natural lakes, <laughs> but man-made. And uh, therefore, um, no, we have not seen that, but it's true that we have seen, we, we can see in Zafarana how do dust settles on the towers. I mean, the welding seams, you can see dust, and of course dust settles on the blades too. <coughs> and rotor blades on wind turbines are like aircrafts. I mean, when you see, the reason why they wash aircraft is that the aerodynamic efficiency uh, is dramatically improved generally when you have a smooth and clean surface. Uh, when you design rotor blades, you try to make them dirt resistant. By, and by that I mean you may sometimes sacrifice a bit in performance by uh, having a, a design which you know is, is less, uh, re, uh, uh, I mean, subject to, to uh, reduction of power performance due to dust. But actually in Zafarana, what happened is that Enria, which is a national, I mean, the new and renewable energy authority, bought a washing machine. So they actually, they wash the blades once a year on their turbines, even on 600 kilowatt turbines, with, uh, which have 60 meter rotors or, or 67 meter rotors and, and 60 meter towers. <coughs> so they actually wash them because you gain mm, about 2% performance improvement by washing the blades. So uh, it's doable. Uh, it, it's not the way we like to do it. We like to think that we can just put them out there. But, uh, but you're right, dust uh, is a problem in desert areas. Second problem in areas like that is uh, hot climate simply. So we have required for this wind farm, and when I say we, I talk about the, uh, the ETC, the National Power Company. Uh, the National Power Company requires that they're operational at temperatures up to 40 degrees Celsius ambient temperature. And trust me, the, even some of the big manufacturers really have trouble with high temperatures. I mean, the oil cooling systems are not built for it. So, so, therefore, we require a prior type certification of the turbine that, it's, that it can run at those temperatures because at the same time, we have very high wind speeds here. As I said, typically in, on this site, we have 10 meters per second mean w annual wind speed, which means that it blows like crazy in summer all the time and not very much in winter. But in summer, the turbines will be running at peak power most of the time. <laughs> and that, together with high temperatures, can mean that you get stoppages of turbines. Okay, so 
why is it important to estimate uh, wind speeds accurately? Uh, now, if we make a ground-based measurement campaign, we might be 10 or 15 percent off the, the actual performance of the wind farm, depending on how good long-term reference series we have. But as you see here, uh, if our wind speed is, is, so if our energy content is within 10 percent, we're reasonably okay. But if, if we, for instance, have uh, made a wrong estimate of, uh, you know, like 15 percent on the wind speed, that means 30 percent on our energy. <laughs> and then uh, uh, we get very, very dramatic changes in, in the rate of return of the wind farm. So this is why bankers are very, very careful about having good wind estimates to begin with because it affects your profits enormously. Okay, so this is uh, really for the presentation I'm going to do later today, but I mean this is really about the various things you can map. IRENA is extremely ambitious. IRENA not just wants to map the physical reality, but also the, um, the, uh, some of the political realities. I'll just show you one more thing, because I also saw that there's a student who works with power, one of the ladies who works with the power uh, <laughs> uh, uh, grids and, and wind energy, I believe, or renewables at least. Uh, just to show you that in addition to storing uh, sorry, in addition to I IRENA wanting to do um, uh, w global wind maps, it might be a consideration for IRENA to actually start helping countries to store historical wind information. And in this case, I'm looking at a bunch of projects I worked on in, in Quebec when I was working with Hydro Quebec. We have a thousand megawatts which is being built in this area. And it's an area of about 250 kilometers in one direction and 100 kilometers in the other. So it's a fairly concentrated area. And what we were concerned with was how will this have an impact, not just on the grid, but actually on the transmission link, because we have a single 300 kilovolt tr transmission line going out there. And our, uh, the national uh, transmission company, Transenergie, was concerned with whether we would be overloading the, uh, the power line. So what we were interested in seeing is that when we built all these wind farms, or the IPP, I mean independent power producers built them, how would that affect the grid? And there you actually have very good and simple tools you can do because I used three anemometer masks, one here, one here, and one here, <coughs> in order to try to estimate <coughs> how this would function. And I used three or four years where I had not only the um, minute or 10-minute ten, ten measurements of, of wind speeds, but I actually also had the load curve, meaning the amount of electricity consumption going on in Quebec at the same time, and where the center of consumption actually is located about almost 500 kilometers uh, towards the west in Montreal. The interesting thing about the study is, first of all, that, uh, as I said, when some people say that uh, renewables are intermittent, it's not true for most of the renewables. They are variable. This is a new terminology which you should learn to be politically correct. Even the International Energy Agency now calls it variable and not intermittent. Because intermittency is when a big nuclear power plant trips off the grid because of a grid fault. <laughs> Variability is when uh, energy uh, varies uh, from hour to hour. And if we look at the hour to hour, hour variations, you can see that in this case where we have about 900 megawatts installed, you will not see that power drops uh, 900 megawatts in an hour. You will see that generally speaking, the hour and the, and the successive hour tend to produce uh, just about the same. These are kind of fun plots, I think, because this is really a, a one way of looking at a wind climate. This is the wind climate in winter, and this is the wind climate in summer. And this is a radar plot where we have uh, midnight here, and then we have uh, 6 o'clock uh, morning here, 12 noon, 6 o'clock evening, and midnight again. So here we start on the 1st of July, I think. No, this is, sorry, this is 1st of January. And then you can see how the wind, and then you have this radar plot. Actually, it was Florence Nightingale who first invented this way of plotting um, you know, doing 
graphic pictures. He used it for the uh, this dead soldiers at Bal the Battle of Balaclava in Russia. But you can also use it for wind power. <laughs> so anyway, <coughs> here you see how the wind picks up and how this is the amount of power generation actually. I mean this is the amount of megawatts we get from our simulation model. And then you can see most of the time we have close to to maximum peak power, but sometimes the wind drops off. But I mean, in generally speaking, you have a very regularly high uh, wind here. Here you see an interesting machine. You see how in summer, because it's a coastal climate, sea breezes are driving the weather. So in the middle of the day, or slightly above afternoon, you have, um, you have higher wind speeds, and at night you have low wind speeds, with the exception of a single night here where you had a lot of wind. But, but here the machine runs, the weather machine runs very, very smoothly and, and systematically. Here it's a bit more chaotic because you have something called a polar front that goes in and out of the area. Now this is kind of interesting for people who deal with uh, power grids because it tells you something, this is the average uh, pattern summer and winter, I won't go into that, <coughs> because it tells you something about the ramping needs in the system meaning how much do you have to change your power generation to match demand because of course it has to match perfectly all the time. The interesting thing is that the blue curve tells you how much is, um, is uh, the, um, uh, this is for zero, ramp, uh, I mean how much of the time don't we have any change and, and then you see changes in the load which is the demand for power. Then we have uh, here pictured the load where we have subtracted uh, uh, wind generation because we say what the system has to cope with is no longer uh, variations in demand, it's variations in demand plus non-dispatchable generation meaning renewables and uh, <coughs> I mean other than big hydro with a lot of big hydro, and, I mean there's 99 percent big hydro so anyway what we find here is interestingly enough that on average when we introduce wind, we get less ramping needs in the system. And this is true all the way until we install 5,000 megawatts of wind in the area. And that's kind of a strange experience because most people would think that wind would uh, influence the balance of the system negatively. But we find actually that on an hour to hour basis in this particular region, wind is positively correlated with demand by 27% positive correlation. So that means that when you introduce more wind, you actually get less variability of the system. So it's not true when power <laughs> company people necessarily fear it. What matters is, is wind load following, meaning does it generate when there's demand or doesn't it? And in this experimental thing, I've added more and more wind in this tiny area of Quebec, just theoretically for the fun of it, and found out that uh, up till 5,000 megawatts of wind, we will actually have less ramping needs in the system. I mean, less needs to go up and down with the hydropower, which is the other alternative, I mean, a, a power generation source. And then at this point, the wind variability itself uh, starts to assert itself. So this is just a detail of what you can do with historical statistics and it's easy to do. I mean, it's, it's, it's very easy to model it. You can do it in an Excel sheet if you want. And just to show you another example, this is a similar one from uh, Jordan. Um, what's happening? It's very slow. <coughs> I wonder when, if the computer works or not. Oh, here it is. <laughs> Magic touch. <laughs> okay, so here you see the, uh, for, for different years, 2001 to 2007, I have looked at the, um, the uh, variation during the day of wind power. In this case, we also have the weather gods on our side, interestingly, because we actually have a weather pattern which peaks towards the evening. This is typical of the wind climate in parts of Jordan and actually several sites in southern Syria have the same property. So there our wind generation peaks at around 8 p.m. which is ideal because our electricity consumption is dominated by private households and increasingly those who can afford it have air conditioning and that's where they start switching on air conditioners and light. So therefore we have a generally a load pattern like this from one or two years 
and you can see it matches fairly well with the wind generation. So again, I, I looked here at the ramping of the wind farm itself because unfortunately I didn't have the load on the system from the consumption, but that's what it looks like. Okay, I won't take all your time. I said that we had a policy discussion, and let me just end with this because this is the last slide, and then we'll get a chance to ask. Uh, sorry, there were questions. Yes, go ahead. Um, yeah. If I just wanted to ask, uh, are these exceptions? Uh, I mean, those cases where uh, the load actually follows the, the generation. You know, you know, uh, I, I don't know, I, I heard some Americans from California say that, oh, wind is always a nuisance because it, it goes, I mean, it, it, it doesn't follow the load. Well, it depends on the climate. But I, I mean, the places I have worked, as I said, we have the weather gods on our side, and by that I mean in temperate climates in most places, particularly in coastal zones, uh, you have high winds during the daytime in the middle of the day, and you have low winds at night. You have high winds in winter, and you have low winds in summer. This is generally true if you are north of the 45th parallel or south of the 45th parallel on the other hemisphere. So in those climates, actually it matches demand very well because in most of these places you have developed countries where a lot of consumption is done by industry and where you actually have the peak on the system generally in the middle of the day, you actually have some peaks in the morning as well which are not quite well met by wind. But in general, you, and you have more, I mean if you go to a place like Quebec or North America, you have a lot of electrical heating also. So therefore, uh, since the energy in the wind and the need for energy for heating for instance varies with the third power of the wind speed in both cases <laughs> due to convection you actually have a very, very good match. Uh, in tropical areas, we often have the inverse pattern or in, in uh, subtropical areas, meaning that we have high winds at night. Uh, in Egypt, for instance, we actually have higher winds at night than uh, during the daytime. And we actually have an increasing amount of electricity consumption. So we have a positive correlation in Egypt then in Jordan and in Syria. And and Quebec, as I'm saying. So most of the, con the areas I have worked in, we have actually had a good experience with being correlated. But as I said, the way you should analyze these things, if you want to look at the capacity value of wind, is that you should see how it is correlated with wind. Just to finish here, what I was saying is that who, who looks, uh, I mean, who does what? Uh, to make a long story short, if government tenders wind on a predetermined site, it's up to the government to do all the pre-development work I've talked about. <laughs> so therefore, this is a work for civil servants or it's a work for the people in the national power company, whoever needs to do it. If the developers themselves find the sites, of course it's up to the developers to use all the mapping tools I've illustrated here. So. Uh, in most of the places in the Middle East where I have worked, it's really up to the national government and the power companies uh, to do the preparatory pre-development work because in those cases we tend to tender wind farms on pre-selected sites. It's different from area to area, but all I'm saying is that the roles change depending on who does the work. 8,760 uh, uh, hours of the year where we have taken a typical uh, wind speed and direction, we then start to put that into the model and the model will run actually theoretically for some hours with that wind speed and let itself adapt to the wind speed. This is done using something which is very nasty mathematically but which is called com computational fluid dynamics. It's differential equations. So you have to, uh, these models chew for quite a while. And the, for this kind of work you really need, I mean in the old days it was supercomputers. Now you, they're still supercomputers but you can actually buy them and, and they're not that huge. But uh, in the case of the country where, where I come from originally, I mean from Denmark, uh, there are two or three supercomputers there and actually 90% of their time is used on uh, wind energy <laughs> because this is where you need this enormous amount of, of computer power. So, so doing a calculation for, uh, I don't know, a medium sized country, I mean 500,000 square kilometers, would probably take from one to two weeks of uh, computing time on a supercomputer which is the equivalent of 100 or, or 200 or 500 <laughs> uh, normal computers. So, so uh, it, it's computationally uh, quite 
uh, intensive. Now, what you get out of it, other than the wind speed, is that um, uh, you, get, you can then calculate, I mean, by simple physics, you can calculate the wind energy. But since we have actually drawn lots over the 30-year period, we also have an idea of the statistical distribution of different wind speeds. And now, by the way, we have extrapolated the wind speed from way up in the atmosphere down to near the ground. And then we get something called the viable shape and scale parameter. The Weibull, there's nothing especially peculiar about the Weibull situation. The reason why we use a function called the Weibull distribution is that it's a nice a mathematical function which is fairly easy to work with and by which you can represent what we call skewed distributions because in most wind climates uh, low winds are very common and high winds are very rare so this sort of a skewed distribution can sometimes be reasonably well represented by that what we're doing is an approximation to reality reality is always much more messy you have much more irregular uh, at any point of the earth you will generally have uh, much more ugly looking wind speed distributions than those you see in textbooks called the Weibull distribution. And the reason is that when the wind changes direction and for instance blows uh, over a mountain ridge or in a valley, then all of a sudden you get different wind patterns. And therefore what you will see generally speaking is for a mathematician, we say different kinds of Weibull distributions which are overlaying one another and in the end you get something that looks like it has two humps instead of a single hump which you're used to in most statistical distribution. So as I'm saying, this is only an approximation. Uh, by the way, not, not, all, uh, not all people who supply mesoscale uh, uh, models, even some of the very big firms actually are managed to, ma uh, managed to mess this up because when you try to force your observations into a statistical distribution, what's very important to the wind industry is that you don't mess around with the energy content. It's very important to us that our model gives an accurate representation of the energy content. So even though I'm an old statistician myself, uh, we're much more concerned with the fact that it doesn't matter to us if uh, we have a perfect fit between our curve and the observations. We're more concerned that we have an accurate representation of the energy because that at the end, what we're trying to optimize here, we're trying to lower the cost as much as possible. Again, using this kind of model, you can get an idea that you will have in most places a different kind of wind climate depending on the season. So, uh, therefore, uh, you have an, an, that option of displaying that. You get a wind rose, meaning you get the probable wind directions. And we're very concerned with the wind directions, of course, because if we have a mountain range or something, we, we should make sure that we build on the, on the place where the wind blows towards the mountain and not away from the mountain, because when it blows towards the mountain, we'll have a speed up effect of the wind. If we're on the other side of the mountain, we'll have a slow down effect. So therefore, we're very concerned with the direction the wind comes from when we try to uh, place our wind uh, farm. And in this interesting example, again, from the Canadian Wind Atlas, which to my mind is one of the best, I mean, it looks very clunky. I mean, the interface is ugly. And, and for those of you who are used to, I don't know, iPhones and beautiful apps, don't even think about it. It's, it's ugly, but it works very well. <laughs> But it was done by scientists and engineers and not done by commercial programmers. So uh, anyway, uh, what you find here is that uh, these guys have taken the great courage to use a generic wind turbine. And this comes as a to surprise to some people, but in basically all wind turbines are alike. <laughs> I mean, th there's so much physics and optimization involved in this uh, that you, if you have a given rotor area, your annual energy production really depends on the rotor area of your turbine and the distance off the ground. I actually once did a, um, a um, regression analysis where I took all the uh, wind turbines on the market in Denmark about 10 years ago, and I looked at the energy production regarding there were about 10 different brands, if you looked at the energy pr production, you could explain the annual energy production on any given site 
simply by taking the rotor area and, uh, uh, and multiplying with the square root of the tower height. And if you do that, you can explain about 99% of the variation. So turbines are not all that different. I mean, there's some very basic physics involved here which is similar. And this is why it's a good idea to use a sort of an average type of turbine. When you go out in the market, you'll find that they're priced differently and therefore you'll choose one brand over the other. But basically their performance is not that different depending on brand. Uh, now here we come to something which is super important and which many people who will sell you mesoscale maps don't even want to talk about unless you ask the question yourself. And that is verification. <laughs> Because it's very nice that you've seen all these colored maps and people will produce them to you and most commercial vendors will not make them like a Canadian wind energy map where you see it's kind of irregular shapes. They'll try to smooth out the, 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 um, the difference between high and low wind areas. And that implies to your mind that you can extrapolate. And that's the worst thing you can do because you can't extrapolate. Because the reason why the model is giving you one result in one square and another result in another square is that they're different conditions. So thinking that you can extrapolate between two squares is wrong, basically. You have an idea of how much the energy jumps from one square you have done to another, but you can't really say that you can extrapolate between the areas. So that's one error you see frequently from commercial vendors. The second thing here, and this is a very, very good way of doing it, and one which I have always tried to, when we have, in the World Bank, have been buying uh, mesoscale modeling of a country, I've always insisted on having some sort of verification because I'm much more concerned with knowing the inaccuracy of our model than I am with whether the data fit. Because there are basically two ways you can buy these mesoscale models. Either you do with them on the basis of the satellite and weather model data, and then you get data which may or may not fit. Now what a lot of companies then do is that they say, okay, but we have a measurement mast here, here, and here. So if we look at this as a, um, let's say that we have the wind speed in, in we do it in a three-dimensional graph, we have the wind speed, so we represent you know, high winds as the top of a mountain and low winds as the bottom, <laughs> then you will see that when you go around the country, then you have wind speeds which vary and which look a bit like a mountain landscape. They take that mountain landscape as if it were made of rubber and then they pull it down or up so that it fits with the actual observations you have in the terrain. This is the way all the wind maps that are supplied by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in the US are delivered. The big problem with doing that is that afterwards you don't have a chance of verifying it because you can't, t they have twisted the data to fit with the actual observations in the country. So nobody has a clue of the precision because they have already tried to fit it <laughs> to what was there. So, so for those of you who are into statistics, you can say that something like that you can't use to test anything because afterwards we don't have a clue whether the model performs well over water and badly over mountains or vice versa, whether it is well, does well in the lowlands and badly in the highlands. So therefore, what the Canadians did here makes a lot of sense. In this case, they have actually a place where it seems to fit perfectly. But what we're not so concerned with is the actual measurements because it's very primitive to say that the wind measurement from one anemometer that you can compare it directly with the modeling. And the reason is that you may have local influences around the anemometer. There could be a tree that's growing in the primary wind direction. In that case, you'll find that year by year, there's less and less wind in the area because the tree is growing. <laughs> so therefore, whenever you have ground-based wind measurements, it's actually not enough to have the measurements. You also need to talk to retired people because you need to have people who know whether the anemometer has been there all that time and whether something has changed, whether somebody has built a building near it <laughs> or whether they have uh, done something else. Uh, and therefore, this is a very cursory examination, but if in this case you have a number of good weather stations, you can actually start finding out, okay, so this model tends to perform well in this and that type of landscape and t tends to perform badly this and there. So that will give you a signal of where you should be careful and where you should, can be more, you know, trust what you're doing. So again, 
this is why you see that what at first sight looked like a perfect planning instrument, in reality you have to apply a lot of experience to it. Uh, again, you can try to correlate measurements with what the model gives you. Actually, when I had a model uh, with a vendor at one point, uh, I insisted the vendor didn't want to do the comparison with, with uh, uh, actual ground-based measurements. But when I forced him to do it, it took him two weeks before he came back. And then he said, <coughs> something very strange here, you know, because it seems that the daily pattern of our wind speeds doesn't match the st uh, observation stations. And then we found out later that it was bec the, the sun rose twice every day. It was a programming error. So therefore, it's very nice to see all this stuff, but it's done by humans and is subject to human error. And therefore, you can't go into a bank with this kind of data, but it can help you find out where you want to measure the wind. So this is typically, this is the newest map I have in my hands. This is a brand new map of Lebanon. <laughs> it was done by a very reputable firm, Garrett Hassan. Uh, and this gives us the wind energy and it, I mean, from the looks of it, it says, oh my goodness, there's a lot of wind up here. Uh, and is this then where we should place our wind turbines? And then my experience tells me, no. <laughs> there are two reasons for that, first of all, this is a mountain ridge. And therefore, if these are very rugged mountains, we actually need a mapping of what I call steep slopes, as we had earlier. Because there is probably a lot of turbulence here. So although this model tells us that theoretically there are high wind speeds there, I bet you that we couldn't place a wind turbine here probably, because it's probably too much turbulence. So very often, we get these false signals, uh, which means that it's a little hard to use this. Uh, we have something over here which looks nice. Uh, the problem is, however, and this is something. Pardon? It's border, it's border, so. Yeah, no, but it was calculated. I mean, uh, across the border. It, so it, it's it's not really a phenomenon that that's due to the fact that we have border. Uh, con I mean, boundary conditions. 